Hi everyone and welcome back to my take on it with your angelic karma. It is Tuesday night, August 15th. You all remember that cut. You know, I used this that used to be how many of you like that um intro better than the um my take on it with your angelic karma welcome and whatever he says i don't even i'm not even listening when he said it. okay uh which one do you like the best this was one of the this is the one that i actually picked out i used to play this a lot my capricorn moon self that melancholy that old world romanticism times long gone that we'll never get back that i just can't that nostalgia for the past regarding romantic relationships you know, is, but here we are in 2023, you know, and is, but, but we're most definitely connected to our past lives, especially those of you would like me with your, um, south node and cancer, like my rising side is in cancer, I have cancer at the top and at the bottom, and then moon and Capricorn keep me grounded, okay, so, but still, moon and Capricorn, that old world, nostalgia for the past, Time's long gone. We are live once again. Those of you that want to join up me, most definitely welcome to do so. Come in and say hello. Because I'm going to, this is going to be like some bedtime story energy. So you are, some of you have to be like me, to have put up with me for five years on the podcast. So you have to like be like me, some of you. So that we, some of you that like the, the old world romanticism, dusty books on the shelf, you know, is, and piano and like feeling that melancholy of the heart, like crying nostalgia for times gone that we don't even remember. Like that past lives. When we're talking about past lives, we're talking about these um, spaces in time that are long gone. That's what past lives mean. You know, so we, we talked 1820 started coming up last week and I just... I, I, I researched it yesterday and it was quite funny. The message last night was it was <laughs> and, and it was funny because of the images that I was getting. It, it, it was quite funny and very freeing and liberating. I never thought about the 1800s. I never thought about 1820 like that. Those of you that have been with me, even though my placements with Capricorn are most definitely the 10,000th old fashioned. I never talked about eras or spaces in time like that you know but but 1820 specifically not the 1820s 1820 1820 came up last week and i as soon as it came up i was telling you all about it because it was a message and i most definitely knew it was um past lives for whoever have who, somebody may, maybe somebody navigated towards me that's new and i picked up on that energy because i feel that it's most definitely um someone's energy in regarding their divine mask and last night it was very funny it, it was it was funny to me because of the image that I got and, and, and the messages. It, they were just so funny, you know, but sweet and sad and melancholic and, and very telling, you know, and definitely got my attention. But tonight we're going to talk about that time period also. And, and I didn't know until I researched tonight about five minutes before I decided to do this podcast. I don't prepare. I don't know what I'm going to read. I don't know what this is about that I'm going to read. So I just decided I was pulled towards just finding something about 1820, but the romanticism. And I didn't know that 1820, I'm just finding out here that is, it was called the romantic period and it was 1820 specifically to 1900. And even when you were talking about music history and, and romanticism and the romantic era, 1820 to 1850. And, and I had no idea of that, that 1820 was significant. And, and old world romance, it, they don't make men like that anymore. <laughs> the, the, the men nowadays that are older and closer to 1820. <laughs> <laughs> because of their age, <laughs> you know, they, they want to be seen as young and hip and, uh, and fast and quick and cool and dude like that. So, and, and it makes them look 
more close to the eighteen twenty, like that. So it's like, so I guess they should get alive in alignment with the eighteen, the romanticism of eighteen twenty. Okay, that's what I feel, and they will look a lot better now. So is because that was a very um, beautiful time period, and we're gonna um, read about it here. So sit back, relax, get your coffee, snuggle up. It's 9.27 p.m. where I am. Those of you that are already in bed or with your coffee or reading or something. Not, well, some people do drink coffee at night. I have a cup beside me with your hot cocoa. Oh, it's too hot here to be drinking anything. I'm still drinking it. It's not coffee, is it, for weather. Now, is whatever you drink at night, just snuggle up with that. And I'm going to read this. The Romantic Era, 1820. 1820 who knew that that was a specific date like i did not the romantic era 1820 to 1850 by susan jarrett okay the romantic period derives its name from romanticism a term used to describe a movement in art literature and music that valued freedom of expression Romanticism began in England and spread throughout Europe and the United States. Romanticism was a rebellion against the current classical rules governing creative work. Followers of the romantic idea believed that the innermost emotions should be expressed, art should please the scenes, and imagination was more important than reason. Romantics also had a deep connection with the past and often revisited historical tales in their art, writing, and music. And and, and that and it best it for us to, to, to bring up the question of why in the past were the, were was creativity and art so um common and of the norm like that? It was but it, even when in 2023, it's like something we're bringing back. But back then, and, and you know, times don't go and they usually get a negative name. But I have some type of nostalgia for some reason because I have an ancient moon sign for those time periods that we don't even remember. Past life energy, um, the music, the art. I like the melancholic, like the introduction that I put in, like the piano. I play the flute. I like the... Um, I, that type of music is what I like. It, it is very, uh, it's deep. Even though I like classical music also, but, and, and that could be considered classical, but it's quite different. So, but, but it, that question of it, art being something that is coming back and it's supposed to be trendy when art and creativity and music was something of the norm back then in this era in this time period that's why the past should be valued now let's continue the romantic ideology espoused by writers such as lord george gordon byron connected with the american people and had a significant influence on popular culture american romantics had an innate love for goodness had an innate love for goodness truth and beauty and believed these were qualities all individuals were capable of possessing the revolution in printing technology alone with increased literacy amongst the American population gave rise to the widespread popula popularity of other romantic writers such as Keats, Emerson, and Thor. Okay, and let's talk about the literacy. Last night when we were talking about 1820, it, well, yesterday before I made the podcast last night, in the initial podcast yesterday, I talked about uh, when I was channeling, I talked about lovers writing some writing something in a time period. And then last night when I was um, channeling, I, I, I spoke about that being common, that that's how lovers would communicate back then. People that were in love, divine masculine, and feminine through letters and how the majority of the population were literate, more literate than we are now in 2023. The romantic heroine was innocent and virtuous. She was known to faint easily as a result of inner spiritual turmoil. In England, followers of romanticism rejected social conventions like marriage. Prior to this period, marriage were, marriages were arranged social contracts drawn to protect property and maintain social status. 
But thanks to the influence of romantic ideology, love now became a mandatory requirement for marriages. Okay. And this was in the 1800s. Swedish Nightingale Jenny Lynn embodied the role of the romantic heroine. Okay, and they have a picture of her. Marriages became more egalitarian in America. Romanticism sustained the idea that a woman's place was in the home. Prior to this period, women were treated more with subordinate, more like subordinates than wives. Women now had the opportunity to engage in leisure activities and form friendships with other women. Child rearing became an important part of women's life. Emphasis on the child-centered family emerged. The ed education of children became priority. The ideal wife and mother was an angel of the household. She was virtuous, wholesome, and gentle. She loved her husband and her children and cared about everyone she came in contact with. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? And, and also, what's wrong with um, women's places be, it, being in the home life? Like, what's wrong with the home life? The home, home life for me is what comfort and peace is. And no problems. I feel that as it, as it relates to male female relations, as long as the husband is a good man, is is like um, a man of purity, and I made a podcast about that this morning. I would be it would be a luxury to just have to be in the home life. And I've said this in the past for me specifically, it would be, and I have a lot of places in Capricorn. Maybe that's why I would be honored a man of purity and he wanted my place to be in the home life. Well, I'm already in the home life. Is that my place is already here? Women's fashion, 1820 to 1825. The years 1820 to 1825 served as a transition period between the former empire style and the new romantic style. During this period, the waistline slowly descended back to its normal position as skirts gradually increased in fullness. Skirts of the 1820s were typically gored or cut in an A shape with the narrowest part of the skirt near the waist slowly increasing in width as the skirt progressed to the hem. Buddhists, Buddhists, Buddhists were typically attached directly to the skirts via the waist, via waistband. Wide matching belts with decorative buckles were common as, as accessories. Okay, and then they show a silk ball gown is lavender. Okay. I, I think it's cute, the, the, the dresses. I don't like dresses that are. I think the next picture is more my style. I like this yellow dress with the with the um, balloon sleeves and the cinched in waist, and the dress goes up more to the collar. The first one is is silk, and, and you all know how dresses there. The, the chest part is just a straight. It's a square, and it makes the chest like the the top of the fabric is is at the chest, but it's like square straight across. I don't like that. Okay, but the other dress, I love it. It's very pretty. During this period, cotton was still the preferred dress fab fab fabric. Okay, this one is cotton. This second one, this yellow one that I like. By 1825, border printed cotton was available in, in advancements in textile. Coloration made available in the United States colors such as yellow, orange, brown, and a variety of blues. And this one is yellow. And I like it. Okay, now. It's a cotton dress from 1826 to 1827. It was popular. It's in the Museum of Art. Dresses with ornamentation were a hallmark of the 1820s, especially at the hem lines and sleeves. Ornamentation consisted of embroidery, cut work, matching ruffles and, and ruching, and puffs or matching fabric filled with small bits of batting. The influence of romanticism brought forth fashion trends from the past, such as neck ruffs, slashings. The process of slashings is the process of cutting away fabric to the, reveal what is beneath. Okay. Now, in a variety of medieval, medieval sleeve styles, 
Sleeve styles were both long and short. Romantic era dresses typically were not trained and ended just at the ankles. Okay. They're showing a dress is brown and blue. Very um, creative in the design. Not my style. Then under it, it shows a white one. I like it better than what it is. Oh, and this one, I love it. I love this dress. This one is better than the yellow one. Okay. Now, because of the way this waist is stitched in, and I like the, the um, puff sleeves and the way that the sleeves that are made is very detail-oriented. I like this dress. Now, by the end of the 1820s, the gourd skirt was quickly being replaced by the full panel skirt and small pleats or gathers were used to draw in the fullness at the waistband. Hems gradually began to widen, but would not reach the apex for two more decades. Okay, I like this one. It's a cotton dress also. And it was worn popular in the late 1820s. Now they show the 1830s. I love this one too. Okay. The 1830s saw the height of the Romantic era. It was the period in which the silhouette reached its extreme like two inverted triangles, the 1830 silhouette sought to add as much width to the shoulder line as it did to the hemline. I like this. It has the semi-balloon sleeves in at the at the wrist. A lower arm all the way down to the wrist is um, kind of cinched in. I like it. And the waist is cinched in. And it's a cotton dress also. The, the sleeves are called demijots. Demigod sleeves. Okay, I like this dress. Sleeve styles in the 1830s were diverse, but typically very full. The, the gigot sleeve and the demi gigot sleeve, later referred to as the legoma sleeve in the 1890s, consisted of a large puff sleeve at the armist that tapered down to a narrow closing fit cuff at the wrist. Exactly what I was trying to describe. Both were quite popular. Okay, now these, I love them even more. Okay, there are three um, mannequins. I like all of the dress. I like all the dresses. These are very pretty. Okay, now, fashionable 1830s dresses and suit. The Metropolitan Museum of Art. Many bodices had wide, round, or V-shaped necklines and were, and were worn with a variety of chemisets. Now, or tuckers, large white collars that had lapels extending down the front, called pelerines, became popular in 1830 accessory. Okay, it, it, it looks like, you know how um, football players, they put on those shoulder pads and they put it over their head? Okay, this is a delicate um, cotton, it's pillaring, and it, it you put it around your shoulder and it, fits the way the linebacker stuff, but it's not thick like the linebacker, but it's to give you the image of how the, the shape is. Okay. Now, with the silhouette resembling two inverted triangles, emphasis on a narrow waistline made stays and petticoats a necessity. I like cinched in waist clothing. I feel that that is very beautiful. It's very neat, nice, everything tucked in, very streamlined. I think that looks good. I like looking at pictures of long time, long past when that was the fashion. Romantic era styles were typically very light boned or corded. They laced up the back and had a solid wooden or sometimes ivory bust down the center front. By the late 1830s, multiple layers of petticoats were worn to support the fullness of the skirt panels and a small bustle pad, also known as a skirt and proverb, was worn at the back of the waist so there was one in the back of them okay so they, the women under the dresses were wearing petticoats and sleeve supporters in the 1830s that's when that became popular when venturing outdoors the mantle of manlet was a most fashionable article of outerwear as were wide brim bonnets with high crowns okay very beautiful what they're showing some type of gold tone um, shawl that is made of what looks like satin. It is very beautiful. Now we're going to get into the romanticism and romance. Now, so we're just to, going back on a, um, um, we're go, we just went back to give an idea of how the women were dressed during that time period, 1820 into the 1850s, this talked about. So let's talk about this. 
about the history of romance is what we're going to talk about. And, and this starts off with um, with Valentine's Day. Even though we're far about away from that, but it's romanticism. So it's going to start. It's telling us how Valentine's Day came into um, fruition or became something very popular. Uh, when I lived out of the country, it's not called. It's not Valentine's Day wasn't regarded romantic people. It was the day of love and friendship, like that. In the United States, it's more about romantic your romantic relationship, like that. So is so the, this is the history of romance, and they're starting off with Valentine's Day. The giving and receiving of Valentine's or, or love tokens date to medieval times, but the origins of the modern celebration lie in the 18th century with the rise of romantic marriage. So in the 1800s, so those of you with your divine partner in, in, in the emphasis was on 1820. And I stated last night, it was love marriages. Cause a lot of people, when they hear the old times, they're like, well, it wasn't for love then. Okay. Yes, it was. Okay. So in 1820, with your divine partner, you were in love. And some of these became marriages like that. Okay. It was love marriages. Now, so is during the 18th century, society encouraged young people to select their marriage partners based on their romantic attachments. This was a decided exchange from past pre practices when marriages had been arranged to submit relationships between families or clans and to consolidate fortunes. And I feel that even when they started allowing the, 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 and encouraging the choosing for love, I feel that some families were still wanting, it was about selecting for, um, to cement families or clans and to consolidate fortunes. Why can't you do that and be married for love? Why, why does one, why does it have to be excluded? Why does it have to be one or the other? You can marry for love and for money. Okay. You can you know, so it would be <laughs> that that's my Capricorn moon speaking. I mean, that's why. OK, it's like you, you got to you have to have comfort. OK, so, you know, it, it, it's that. OK, you know, it is those types of things. Why does one have to be without the other is, you know, is what it is now. So the brides and grooms feelings were not of paramount consideration. While love and respect might be a, a byproduct, byproduct of marriage. And, and you know, even with saying that, that back then you didn't marry for love. You just married for money. As if all Americans had money and had some type of money. They were trying to pretend. I don't think that was the case. I think most people were married for love. Like, you know, on a small horse, were married to consolidate the funds. That's what that means. <laughs> Oh, the protective funds. I don't think it was like so many in there. They weren't married. But I think most of those marriages had to be because of love. That's what I feel. You know, but and then love was encouraged. And this was in the 1800s. It was encouraged to marry for love. Now, so, and, and, and even, and it, it had to be, it had, but for the woman it, during this time period, it had to be front and center for her to marry a man for love or for whatever that could take care of her because back then women weren't working or were they? Okay. Now I don't know. We'll have to see. Maybe they're going to mention it. So she had to take those types of things into consideration. And if the man was good to her, the husband or the boyfriend, why would, why would she fall in love with him? Right. Yeah. Why is it so hard to love a rich man? That's my question. Now, while love and respect might be a byproduct of marriage, young couples had not entered, mar entered into marriage with that expectation. That changed in the 18th century. See, 1820 is very important. This is when you're divine. Ma this is probably when people started having divine masculines. Because it's when the love and the encouragement for love and all of that and the romanticism, you know, and everything that came with that. You know what to expect from me, as you have seen my character of a good wife. Suppose I tell you now what I, in my turn, expect and how you must best please me and make me happy. This is the woman to the man. 
does it, it, exactly what I was stating about why can't he be how you want him to be with all the qualities and characteristics and it'll be more of him to love okay this is what she's saying we're going to start over you know what to expect from me as you have seen my character of a good wife she states suppose I tell you now what I in my turn expect and how you may best please me and make me happy this is her to her husband does then I begin, let me ever have the sweet consciousness of knowing myself the best beloved of your heart. I do not always require a lover's attention. That would be impossible, but let it never appear by your conduct that I am indifferent to you. That's Margaret Davenport Coulter to John Coulter to her husband, May 10th, 1795. Okay, she was letting him know right then. Okay, now, so women have more voice than people like to get them credit for having back then. Okay, you know, as in had expectations too. As expectations increase that marriage will be built on a foundation of love, the way that part, on the foundation of love rather than mutual economic interest, the way that partners were selected had to evolve. When parents stopped making the selection, prospective lovers needed to find one another and then determine the, the extent of mutual attraction. Courtship became a distinctive phase of partner selection and familial rituals involved. And I guess it kind of made it difficult for the men back then because the, the woman was choosing for love and love. Well, who was going to take care of her if women weren't able to work? So we have some missing pieces here. Okay. So in a perfect world back then, because she was able to work and take care of herself and, and she was just married for love, it made it difficult for the man because he wasn't able to have his ability to take care of her. And that's the only thing that was looked at. She had to fall, fall in love with him for other qualities and characteristics because she was able to provide for herself is what it is here, basically. Now, so something is missing, so that can't be all true. That may be your romanticized um, version of the story is what I'm getting. So let's see here. Now, but, so we'll just say that 1820 was the beginning of marrying for love and marrying because he could take care of you. But choosing and falling in love first and, and the man begin to understand that even though he could take care of her because women weren't allowed to work, it would be that he also had to bring other qualities and characteristics that caused her to fall in love with him. So the men, it worked out well for the men because now they knew that they were going to be with, with women that loved them like that also and he was providing for them. But they, the woman also loved him is what it is here. She was able to have it all. Him take care of her and he showed character quasi, quasi characteristics that made him lovable. So it kind of, I guess it would have put the men in a catch 22 back then because they weren't able to just use, I can take care of you so it doesn't matter how my character is and it doesn't matter how I treat you. Because it was about the romanticism, him sweeping her off her feet. The romanticism of 1820 means that it was about the divine masculine sweeping you off your feet, being romantic, knowing that he can't just say, well, I'm a doctor, I'm an attorney, I'm a judge, I'm, a, um, I'm the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and, and my character is not great, but because I can take care of you, come on, woman, like that, and your family said it's okay. It became not about that in 1820. It became about that, yes, but he also started wanting to be loved. Some men wanted to be loved, and the women wanted men that they can love. So the man had to had to lead with his personality like that and his his title. So he had to bring all of him to the table. He wasn't just let off the hook because of marriage because it was a marriage for love. Because who was going to take care of the woman? So he wasn't just let off the hook. He was still leading financially. Unless they're not telling us the truth, the women were actually out working. Majority. Okay, so. So courtship became a distinctive phase of partner selection and familiar rituals evolved. Young women. 
Young women, perhaps more than young men, often enjoyed the process of courtship as it represented a time of freedom of choice. That's what I stated. It was good for the woman because she was going to get the whole package in the man like that. And, and, and it kind of put the man in a catch-22, as I stated, because it, it was good for him before the 1820s. Because before the 1820s, the parents were arranging the marriages. And it was based on who could provide for the woman. The man, the man could be abusive. He could not be romantic. He, his personality did not matter. I'm pretty sure most of the families didn't say just give their daughters to those types of men. Or did it just um, co-sign on those types of relationships. So I was a little bit extreme with that. But it would be the, the man before 1820, he was... His ability to take care of the woman was what was primary. And if he had a decent per enough personality for the family, his personality wasn't about winning over the woman and being romantic with her before 1820. It wasn't. Now, in 1820, it became about everything, all of him. His title in society, because he was the economic breadwinner, because we're talking about 1820. Now, so it would be um, his title in society. And also his personality, because he wanted to be loved and she wanted to love him. And she was choosing. They state that the woman became had the freedom of choice in 1820 to choose who she wanted to be with. The selection of a husband was the most important decision a girl would make. And it was also the most autonomous. Autonomous means independent. Courting, courting empowered young women. They decided who to accept or reject. And some wielded their power ruthlessly. Exactly. That and in that ruthlessness is about what I just stated. When I stated, why do you have why does he have to be not with money for you to love him? Why can't you have it all? Why can't he bring everything to the table? And that caused you to fall in love with him. I guess that would be ruthless. I don't think it would. It would be called, it would be whatever the qualities and characteristics of women needs to have that makes her feel happy and makes her fall in love with him. And it kind of um does put the man. Even back then, it, it took the freedom of choice. It, it gave the woman the freedom of choice. And it kind of put the man that catch 22 or having to be, be all he could be. And that was more than about his capabilities. It was about his personality. It was him really selling himself like that. Now, so, this is what she states also to her husband. You know I have never with all my faults betrayed one symptom of vanity. But now if you should discover a little spice of it can you wonder just at this moment or at my entire disposal two of the very smartest bows this country can boast of there is much no this is a woman courting two men and choosing and let's talk about back then women and women were freer than people like the let on in 2023 because i i even remember as a teenager reading something about women courting back then uh, like um they would call it because i'm from a small town in georgia she would have company um uh, with more than one man like it would be two men wanting her heart and at her family's permission and attending the courting session, she'll be choosing between the two, and it, it will be who wears her heart like that is like who she falls in love with, who's offered a better deal. <laughs> I guess that that rule. <laughs> it's okay. Most of the stuff that I say, excuse me, because my mood is in capital, so you all should know they can't enjoy, ignore your angelic karma. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> so it's like it's it's like who is catching her heart? It's it's not, and, and they try to make it sound in twenty twenty three like women were just ushered and thrown into marriages with men that they didn't want. I'm pretty sure that was the case sometimes, but they're talking about what happened in eighteen twenty, and women. And this woman is even stating is stating in her manuscript that that two of the finest bows men in the in the um country were were courting her to win her heart for marriage. And courting is for marriage. Not running around with and sleeping with her, courting her, trying to woo her like that, trying to get her hand in marriage. And they were bringing her best foot forward, not half-stepping like that. So we're going to start off with what her manuscript states. And this is from 1820. We already had the wife. Now we have the courting young woman. And she states, you know, I have never with all my faults betrayed one symptom of vanity. But now if you should discover a little spice of it, 
can you wonder? Just at this moment or at my entire disposal, two of the very smartest bows this country can boast of. There is much speculation going on as to the preface I should give, and though I do not intend to practice one coquettish air, yet for my own amusement, do I intend to leave these speculating geniuses to their own conjectures till I have made up my mind. Eliza Ambler to Mildred Smith. February 1785, 1785, this is before 1820. People wanted to know who she was going to choose, you know, and they were courting her and wooing her and trying to win her over but for marriage. You know, courtship requires its states. The, pr the prospective lovers reveal their feelings and they, they do so more creatively and sincerely than their competitors. Exactly. That's the men. The women weren't competing, competing for men. The men were competing. And they were out. They would know that women would have a company of three gentlemen like that and that he was one of the gentlemen, one of the three. And he was bringing his best foot forward. Like that. She would have already told her parents, well, I want one that I want to court a doctor and, and I want to court an attorney and I want to court the man that owns this shop down the street. And to see which one is best for as a husband. Now, what's wrong with that in 1785? And, and do you think that she was do, she was seeing which one of them she liked the best and that was going to woo her enough for her to fall in love with them? Who was going to win her heart? I don't see anything wrong. I think women back then, because all my placement in Capcom was smarter than the women now. Smarter, astute, more reserved, more conservative, more of self-worth and value. And the men had to fall in line with that. She wasn't going to be chasing and running up and down and ripping up and down the street for them and having sex with them. They were going to bring presents and gifts and candy and, and everything and flowers. And be happy to be in her company and presence. My moon and Capricorn says that's, that's the order of the world. That's the world where it should be. That's the natural order of things. I don't know who had a problem with it. Now, not that everything was perfect back then, but this was perfect. Now, okay. Exchanging Valentine's became a popular way to express those feelings. A popular 18th century Valentine form was a handmade love letter puzzle. Men need to go back to using their hands, glue, and scissors and know how to write. Because back, back then, last night, the people in 1820 were, were, were more literate than we are in 2023. What does that tell you? And men were writing love letters, making arts and crafts to show their love and affection. Stepping up to the plate, weren't able to rip and run the street and be womanizers the way they get up. Men get away with too much in these modern times. And people could say, well, that's because the men are free. No, they were free before 1820 when the woman just had to go with him and his personality didn't matter. And then they stopped being free, obviously, in 1785, free to an extent like that. Now they're completely free. They get away with everything. They, they get away with everything. Not being able to put a sentence together in a text message. Not being able to put a sentence together with their mouth on the phone. Not treating you right. And not being embarrassed by it. And the, back then, it would have been ostracized in society for the way men behave now with women. Cussing and spitting on you if you don't move. Doing everything that they should be embarrassed to do. It 
But then back then they were acting like gentlemen and knew that the one was going to be courting. His time was going to be at three. The other one's time was going to be at three thirty, like that. And he was going to act like a gentleman, like he had home training and would be held accountable for his actions. He wanted to be seen and respected in a certain way. And knew that he was going to be chosen, so he had to have put his best foot forward. He wasn't the end all be all. There were other two, two other men waiting for their turn too. Like that, men were behaved in a respectable way. Now they're smoking, drinking, using drugs, spitting on women, pee peeing behind the store, or behind your house, or behind your car, or in public places. Acting like it's a jungle out here. Treating women how men are allowed to behave. Men treat women how the men how society allows men to behave and based on what men are now allowed to get away with. Back then, men would have been ashamed. Not that women's treatment was good back then, because you you all you had the same thing you have now. Now it's just part of the normal. It's just it, it is just appears to be free. It, back then, men were accountable for how they treated women, because it would get around like that. A popular 18th century Valentine form was a handmade love letter puzzle. The writer intricately folded the paper, writing a different sentiment in each section. As the beloved unfolded a valentine, her lover's feelings were revealed. Many were sentimentally preserved and reside in museums, collections today. And they show a beautiful, oh, we used to make these in school. I didn't know that that was popular back then. They show a beautiful um, um, love letter Valentine that a man made for a woman that he was courting. It is so pretty. Handwritten. Strap of paper, ink pen. 2023, you give a man a strap of paper and an ink pen, he probably doesn't even know what paper and ink pen, what you're supposed to do with that. They don't even know how to answer text messages. So I, I'm pretty sure they don't know straps of paper and ink pen. They're like, this is foreign. And so we might need to go back to this time period when they had to impress you like that. Okay, like this. Now, or they had to at least put their best foot forward and spit when they get out of your presence and out of, from in front of you. Okay, like that. 19th century romance evolves. Romance blossomed in the 19th century American culture. Both men and women were encouraged to express their most intimate thoughts in letters. High literacy rates and a reliable postal service facilitated romantic communication. Letter writing culture flourished. Letter writing manuals provided sample love letter languages for those who were not naturally adept at self-expression. Or lovers could quote their favorite poets, drawing from an abundance of romantic literature. Okay. So the men used to draw, they used to quote, quote poetry to the women. They used to write letters to the women. Now they're sending you a penis picture. And it's the norm. Elizabeth Barrett published a love poem she composed for her future husband, Robert Browning, at his insistence. After overcoming her reluctance to share their intimate correspondence. So her husband insisted that she share their, um, the love letters that she composed for him. He insisted that she did, but she didn't want it to share it because it was intimate. This is what she wrote him. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth of height. My soul can't reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. 
I love thee purely as they turn from praise. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Sonnets from the Portuguese Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And then they have the original copy here of her handwritten letter to him. One of them. He wanted the world to know about that letter. Do, do the men in 2023 want to be loved? Do they want to come from the depths of their heart and be loved? And chosen for that? And for everything else they bring to the table. The fashionable American letter writer or the art of polite correspondence containing a variety of plain and elegant letters on business, love, courtship, marriage, relationship, friendship. 1839 was when she wrote this to him. More casual lovers, those of less intimate acquaintances, were able to purchase ready-made valentines in the mid-19th century. The first commercial valentines sold in the United States were reproduced by the Mount Hollier graduate Esther Holland following her college graduation in 1847. Women went to college in the 1800s. Holland. When I hear people talk about women, I have, they make it sound like women have been in the, beside the stove in the kitchen up into the 1960s. Beside the stove in the kitchen. Holland began to produce this and sell fancy paper, sell fancy paper valentines. In 1850, she expanded her operation, hiring local women to craft elaborate. So she had, did women have businesses in the 1850s? And I know not all women would have had business because not all women are successful today either in this 2023. But still, it would, it, it, with the way people talk about back then, they make it seem like women, no women had nothing. And women weren't allowed to do anything other than from the bedroom to the kitchen. A lot of misinformation out here. Hiring local women to craft elaborate cre creations with ribbons, glitter, and paper laced in an assembly line fashion. Holland ran her New England Valentine Company until 1881 when she sold it to George C. Whitney Company. So women, I thought women weren't able to own property. See, this is going to open a different can of worms. In a business's property, if you can sell it, that means you own it. Let's continue. Okay. She, so she sold it to George C. Whitney, to the George C. Whitney Company, headed by one of her former employees. The New England Valentine Company had annual gross sales of $100,000 at the end, demonstrating that romance could turn a profit. So back then, that was a lot of money. Postcard Valentine's 1907. Securing a mate, it states. Throughout the 19th century, middle and upper class married women were idealized for their role as mothers and helpmates, whereas earlier generations recognized women as making economic contributions to households and family businesses. 19th century social conventions diminished their role. Instead, their part, their part often called the cult of domestic domesticity so so they're saying that the women's role got diminished in the 19th century often called the cut of domesticity was to create was to create a pleasant and restorative environment for their husbands while raising children to be contributing citizens when households began to be cons constituted as a breadwinner, husbands and home make a wife, 
The practical advantages of marriages, such as the wife's ability to economically manage a household, were minimized. So in the 1900s is when women start to be in the house and looked at as the mother and the wife. And her, her ability to economically manage the household was minimized. So before that, the woman was managed in the household economically. were minimized. While romantic love flourished, there was an increasing idealization of women as mothers and wives. So when, when women started marrying for romantic love, that's when they start being looked at as women and as mothers and wives. So when they weren't married for the romantic love, what were they doing? Running businesses and marrying the man for the economic status? And then when the 19th, 19th century hit, they start being, and then when they start marrying for love, and, and after that, the 19th century hit, they started being looked at as mothers and wives. And, and being in the home life. Women's eligibility, el eligibility for marriage became increasingly tied to their appearance and social ability. This is in the 1900s. Though wealth and familiar connections remain important factors to prospective partners, men took the lead in partner selection, choosing which women to pursue while women waited to be selected. So things became reversed in the early 1900s, but in, 18, in the late 1700s, in the 1820 women were choosing. So then in the 1900s, men started choosing the women for their appearance and choosing which woman to pursue and select. There was an expectation that everyone would eventually marry both men and women, but men were expected also to establish a career and a public persona. For women, becoming a wife and mother was an achievement to aspire to. This was in the 1900s it became that. The early 1900s. Therefore, women were discouraged from participating in activities that might make them less suited to marriage, such as higher education. Because the other girl graduated college in the 1800s. So in the early 1900s, women started to be um, encouraged not to pursue college and, and to wait for the man to choose them for motherhood. And to be a wife. But before that, the woman was choosing the man to be courted by multiple ones. So, so, therefore, women were discouraged from to participate in activities that may make them less suited for marriage, such as higher education. Society was furthermore suspicious of women who did not marry often characterizing them as deviants or old maids and limiting their options. So this was in the early 1900s, this became popular. Modern romance. I, I told y'all this modern is as close to we became to being modern is, this, is when things start messing up. And we have it in reverse. Well, y'all have it in reverse. You know, not that back then things were great but hell there was a hol I mean you know modern romance while romance remains a prime con consideration in partner selection for 21st century women the interest in selecting a partner has waned in 2008 the Pew Trust found that only 16% of occupied of, of uncoupled Americans were actually actively looking for a partner Cause all the romance got took out of it. That was there in the 17 and 1800s. The man doesn't have to woo you. The man doesn't have to respect you, and he's not going to be held accountable for not. There isn't a code of conduct and a behavior that he has to follow, and the woman too. That's why nobody's interested in being in a romantic relationship. If you don't move your foot quick enough, quick enough, he'll spit on your shoe. 
You have to sort through Peter's picture to figure out which one you want and select which one you want. So, uncoupled Americans were actively looking for a partner, and then, and when they are searching for love, marriage is not necessarily their romantic goal. In 2012, 23% of American men and 17% of women over age 25 had never married, doubling from 1890 when 11% of men and 8% of women had never married. While marriage rates were down, cohabitation, cohabitation for unmarried men and women has increased. About a quarter, 24% of never married young adults aged 25 and 34 live with a partner in 2015. Social scientists have explored factors contributing to a decline in the marriage rate. They point to shifting public attitudes towards cohabitation, increasing acceptance of singledom, difficult economic times, and women's increased economic independence. Romantic love in modern times has a different feel when women no longer see marriage as an end goal, but rather partnership between equals. So out of romance love. And now we're in heaven like that. Okay. So but, uh, does, uh, those of us that still like the romance, it would be, <laughs> we could feel quite out of place like that and looking around. It is like, hell, but it's good for business. But it's like, and divorce attorneys, it is like, is. Is is is? I guess in the paper company went under, and where they sell the ink pens and the pencils. So, and the penis picture industry should be booming. So, welcome to the future is what I'm getting. Okay, everyone. Until next time. Thanks for listening. Bye.